everybody. Uh, I'm really excited about our uh, session this morning that's focusing on systems and systems thinking. And uh, Chip Walker has been working in PPL for years now and has uh, been certainly a leader in our agency. Uh, so Chip has been a, a leader in our agency in terms of this take, uh, bringing a systems approach to the kind of work we do. Um, and I just wanted to, uh, I wanted to start with talking about what I see as some of the challenges uh, for us in our agency. Um, I think that we, it, what we have been doing is we've had a number of presentations in this room. In fact, uh, Eric is here from IFC and he he, the work that Cedars has been doing in the area of health systems, also very interesting. We've had a number of presentations on market systems, and our practitioners um, that MPEP associates with have been working in what they feel are mar our systems for a long time. And um, so I think that a key challenge is taking the systems theory and making it practical bringing it down to implementation. And I remember when I heard the Cedars presentation, I thought, that is really interesting. I don't understand it, but it really did impress me. <laughs> so how do, we, how do we take this very theoretical thinking? And sometimes um, it, it seems very uh, academic. How do we make it very practical? Um, I think that uh, also asking, you know, making sure that systems thinking and systems approaches are not a solution looking for a problem. But we really make it clear why, why it's important and how it's important. And I would argue, and I think probably if you're here, you would argue the same, that we think that systems thinking can bring a lot to our programming and in, by improving the results that we get from what we do. Because I think most of us feel we've been working in systems for forever. We live in systems. And that we've just sort of ignored the complexity of it and the implications of that complexity. Um, and finally, I wanted to say that I think that we, to, to bring it down to some practical level, I think we need to think about how systems thinking affects the design of activities that we do, how it affects how we implement on the ground, and how it affects how we monitor and evaluate our results. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Chip. Well, good morning, everybody, um, both uh, here in person and uh, online. Uh, it's really a, a pleasure uh, to be here this morning and uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, the work that we've been doing, uh, particularly around uh, the release of a draft paper, uh, which I hope uh, you've all had a chance to, to look at. Um, this uh, paper on, on local systems, a framework for supporting sustained development. Um, if you uh, weren't aware, you can uh, get a copy of it through a link uh, on the event webpage. Um, so uh, what, I want, what I really want to do today is uh, to hear as much from you as you from me. Um, I uh, really do uh, think that we have uh, an opportunity uh, here uh, to really make some important progress on embedding uh, systems thinking in the agency. And I want to, you know, I've been working on this for quite some time, as Jean has alluded to, um, but I really see this as a really golden opportunity to make some significant progress. I'm going to tell you why in a few minutes, um, but I just want to get the benefit from all of your experience and expertise about how we can make full best uh, use of this uh, sort of uh, window of opportunity um, because these things don't come along all that often. So, to, but before we sort of open it up and have a, have a conversation about that, I think that I need to do two things for you, uh, to sort of help uh, set the stage. One of them is that I need to flesh out a little bit about the context that we're working on in this, on this topic within the agency. And that includes uh, what's in this paper. Um, and so, you know, what I'm looking for in part is, you know, once you sort of understand this, is how can we uh, strengthen this, uh, you know, how can we, 
well, the comments can also include how can we strengthen the paper itself to make sure that we have the strongest possible platform uh, in order to um, um, uh, move this agenda forward. Uh, and the second thing I'm going to do a little bit is to give you at least my own personal perspective um, on what I think uh, we need to do in terms of how to think about systems given some of the contextual issues. Um, and to sort of help make it clear about what sort of the official line and then what's my own thinking uh, that you'll see as we go through the slides a bit of a convention. If the slides have got white backgrounds, that means that this is sort of essentially what's in the paper right now. This is sort of more, more or less official uh, thinking on it. If it's got a gray background, then it's all about, this is all my views. So, um, what I'd like to, to do to, to start with oh, let's get rid of that, is to talk a little bit about the origins of this paper because that's in fact uh, an important piece of the context. And uh, for some of you this may be a little bit new, others I think maybe a little old hat. So essentially the paper grew out of an F, uh, a desire in the agency to explicitly address two issues. One of them is the aid effectiveness agenda. Um, uh, as many of you may know, about two years ago, uh, uh, the world gathered in Busan in South Korea uh, to talk about uh, aid effectiveness. This was the fourth in a, long, in a series of conversations about it. Uh, most famously, the, the, uh, one of the early ones in Paris released the Paris, uh, the Paris Declaration of Principles around aid effectiveness. One of those principles was uh, an explicit agreement on the part of both uh, developing countries and those who are supporting them uh, to promote uh, uh, the use of country systems. And initially, the definition of country systems meant uh, word, I mean, essentially, they were using the, system, the word system as a synonym for process. So in other words, it was government processes, primarily pu public financial management processes, so the idea, the sort of the vision was uh, donor countries would give increasing amounts of funding directly to governments and they would use their own budget uh, priority setting processes and budget execution processes and internal audit procedures and so forth to essentially manage those results uh, to achieve development objectives. Um, Obviously, one of the underlying rationales for doing this um, was in part because of this commitment to sort of saying the countries better understand their own situation better than outsiders do, but also that this, you know, essentially using and strengthening and using these country systems was essentially a necessary step towards the sustainability of these processes. Now, as time has gone on in that in the eight years since that um, the Paris Declaration was issued. Uh, there has been some rethinking about, about this, um, and most notably at Busan was a very clear sort of adjustment in the basic orientation to become more inclusive. And by inclusive, what they meant was that ownership meant more than just simply ownership by the government. It needed to be, if you will, more of a whole of society ownership. And similarly, this issue around systems really needed to be thought of is a broader set of uh, relationships uh, that exist not only within government, but between government and other parts of society. So that was sort of the, uh, the vision that was sort of put out there uh, in Busan. Um, I'm happy to say that the US government, both USAID and the State Department, were very uh, sort of essential parts of pushing this inclusivity emphasis at Busan. Um, but part of the challenge is, is that after the document uh, was produced, it sort of has raised questions about sort of saying, OK, how do we move that agenda forward? And actually, um, even though it's been two years, very few donors uh, have actually put out statements about how they really are going to embrace that inclusive part of the Busan agenda. So in some sense, since we had been pushing for this, we felt it was really important to take full advantage of this opening and uh, uh, this emphasis on inclusivity and write something that said, this is how USAID understands the Busan agenda, and this is how we're going to carry it out. Again, I, I just want to stress the emphasis here on sustainability. The other piece of it, um, a little bit closer to home, had to do with USA Forward, which is uh, probably most of you know, were a set of reforms that uh, the current administrator, uh, Dr. Rajiv Shah, uh, initiated when he uh, assumed uh, that position 
uh, in 2010. And again, part of the emphasis there is about improving USAID's ability to support sustainability. And part of it includes improvements in the way that we plan and execute our programs. But part of it also is a renewed emphasis on providing funds directly to local actors, whether they are local governments or local civil society, a local private sector. But it is sort of an understanding that that particular kind of direct support, or what we've come to call localized aid, uh, is a necessary element in the toolbox along with other uh, things that we have done. However, we didn't really ever come up with a very good sort of well-grounded argument about why it was important uh, for us to uh, include more localized aid in this process. And so, again, we may be a little late in this, but we felt it was important for us to also have a statement about how that particular kind of approach felt uh, f uh, fit into a larger agenda to support uh, sustainability. Uh, and again, uh, the Paris, uh, the Busan uh, agenda. However, I mean, one of the things as we began to work on this, you will notice, is that the was the word country and the and then the word system. And as I said, initially it was not really used as as a in the real sense of system as a real sort of systemic kind of a concept. It was a synonym for processes. But there were some of us who thought, well, we have an opening here. That we can make more of this word system and really turn it into something meaningful. And that was really the uh, other thing. Oops, excuse me. So it was a little bit of a stealth effort um, to include this idea of saying we have this word system, let's make the most of it. The other thing, as you'll notice, is that we've also chosen to make a shift away from the sort of conventional terminology in this arena of country system and focusing on local system. And part of the reason for doing that was because uh, we, you know, the, the term country system has basically been captured by this idea that this is really only about governments. And uh, we felt that we, you know, rather than simply talk, you know, hyphenate it with inclusive country systems or some other locution which wasn't going to work very well, we thought this word local systems, although it itself, in and of itself, has problems uh, about what you really mean by local in this case, um, we thought was a better term. Now, why did we, so what are we hoping that we're going to get out of embracing system in a more systemic way here? I mean, I think. Um, one of the real thing, real arguments is that we really believe that it is the system that is really needs to be the focus of our sustainability efforts. Uh, we have had sustainability and USA documents for quite some time, but one of the big arguments is what exactly are you trying to sustain? You know, is it the outputs? No. Is it the organizations? No. So we need something to talk about what we are sustaining, and in this case. Um, we felt that, that fo shifting the focus to a system, whether it's a market system or a service delivery system, um, that is really what it is that we're trying to sustain. And I think that that's a helpful uh, addition and, and clarif clarifying move. The other thing I think that we really wanted to emphasize, and that this is implicit in this idea of inclusivity, is the fact that none of these things that we care about, whether it's improved health care, improvements in the environment, if it's improvements in, um, uh, in maternal and child health, uh, none, uh, agriculture, none of these things happen by the actions of one organization or one you know, government or uh, alone. This, these things generally are co-produced. They require the actions of lots of different actors working um, uh, sometimes in competition, sometimes cooperatively with one another uh, in order to produce these results. And so the, how do you capture this idea of co-production? Well, I think this idea of systems is a useful mechanism to really emphasize uh, that that is, in fact, what's going on. And then the last, and another, I think, important part of this is, is that, at least in many systems thinking constructs, is this idea of dynamism and adaptability. And one of the things I think that we really felt was important um, was to make sure that we were embracing a concept that really embraced adapt adaptation and and resilience as a sort of a core as a core element. Because 
sustainability doesn't mean building it once and hoping that it persists. It's about creating a capability that has self-adjusting properties to it so that as the environment changes, you can in fact have changes in the, uh, in the system itself. That's an essential part for sustainability. So in that sense, we felt that, that trying to bring in some systems thinking into the way that we were talking about this was an important uh, was 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 going to give us uh, uh, some important leverage over the over the problem. So in that sense, what the paper tries to do is to address all of these things: um, the aid effectiveness agenda, uh, USAID forward, as well as the systems thinking. So when we talk a little bit more about systems, and now we you notice it's gray. Um, I think that. Oftentimes, when people come to this term of systems thinking, this is what they think of, or something like it. In other words, it's a systems diagram. And one of the things I think we, we've tried efforts at USAID. We have tried to introduce ideas of systems diagrams. We have done training around it. And the reaction is usually, hmm, this is cool. But when they try to do it, it this is hard. And so they get turned off. And frankly, you know, I think I've come to the, con to the realization and is that what we're talking about here is not about a specific tool. It, we're not trying to say that the way, the way forward is we need to turn everybody into a systems mapper. That's not what the point is. And in this, you know, I, this, think, sort of this sort of evolution of my own thinking about this, um, I really have to credit Bob Williams. I don't know how many of you know Bob Williams, but uh, he, has been a, uh, he comes out of the evaluation field. Uh, he's based in New Zealand and has written a number of of books on both evaluation and then also on, on systems thinking. Um, I have a particular citation to a particularly good book, which I will get to in two slides. But uh, anyway, uh, you know, this is sort of the way that, that he uh, also talks about it. So it's really not about this issue about a particular specific tool. Um, what he points out, and I, uh, he, he sort of pointed me in this direction, uh, believe it or not, there have been people out there for quite some time going out and mapping all of the various sort of antecedents to various types of systems thinking, and you end up with this, you know, explosion of lines like this. All the point being is that um, there are lots of different kinds of systems thinking. There are lots of ways at it. He actually has a little circle up in the corner that talks about the kind of approach that he has. So. The, the point is, is that it, you know, we could spend an awful lot of time, time arguing about whether my tool is better than your tool and whether yours is right or wrong. And I just think that that's probably a, not a very helpful way, to, helpful way to go. What he suggests and what I sort of have bought into is the idea that it's really about how to start thinking systemically. And to do that, what he, what he suggests is, is that this idea of system is you know, to remember that this is really just simply a human construct, a, an idea that we impose on the world to help better make better sense of it. And therefore, um, you know, and so in that sense, there really isn't a system that you, a tangible system that you can point to out there. It's really a, an idea that we carry around in our head and that the value of it is in terms of help, does it help us make sense of some very complicated and messy situations. And one of the things that he offers is that Thinking systemically, uh, again, can embrace all sorts of different tools that can help you make sense, but that these three ideas that he has here, and talking about that would be a seminar in itself, boundaries, interrelationship, and perspectives, um, are essentially key elements. And he, he makes the argument, and I don't know whether, you know, I don't know if he's been able to sort of uh, establish it, that if you go back to that messy picture, uh, that actually one thing that they all do share is that one way or the other, they are concerned with these three topics. Of, but it's essentially a way of trying to make sense of what uh, is going on out there. It's a construct. Um, and that, that it, that it uh, embraces a variety of different tools. And then the other thing that he often uh, he argues for is beyond thinking systemically is about how to be systemic. And he, in this chapter that I've, I've cited here, he comes up with a couple of ideas one of the things that I took away from it, though, is that there's a fair amount of overlap between the six uh, uh, ideas that he has here and the principles that we identify in the paper. So in that sense, 
what I would argue is that what the paper is really arguing for is less about the choice of a, one particular tool or another. It's about how can we Im better embed both the thinking and the being systemic into the corporate culture and operations of USAID. And through us, through our, excuse me, through our various partners. So back to the paper. So, the, so what the paper actually talks about in terms of moving forward on this local systems uh, uh, agenda uh, and how, you know, and making, beyond making the connection to sustainability, it sort of looks at these four areas of uh, attention that we need to look at. And I'll just go through them. I'm going to go through them, although I'm going to spend a bit more time on the first one. So the first one is essentially this idea of understanding these systems. And again, this goes in part to assessment. It goes to this question about maybe tools that we would use to try to understand what's going on. Although um, it does indeed talk about mapping, but I want to make be clear that mapping in this in this way is not what we mean by necessarily going out and doing a systems diagram. It means essentially coming up with some sense of who are the actors that are involved in it, and what are the critical interrelationships that exist between them? Now, one of the things that the paper puts forward as a way of under so first of all, again, that it's just important to reiterate that what we're talking about here is a constellation of actors. They may be governments, they may not be. You know, I mean, they may be private sector, they may be civil society, they may be individuals, they may be advocacy organizations. There are any number of different kinds of actors that may be involved here. Now, one of the things that the, that the paper puts forward, albeit rather briefly, is a way of understanding these systems is by examining them in terms of these five R's. Resources, roles, relationships, rules, and results. And talk a little bit more about, about that. So essentially, the way in which we came up with this was if you go back to a very simple open system diagram, Normally, it has basically a couple of basic parts. One of them is that this is an open system, that it, there, there, it's a, uh, a, me a mechanism that translates inputs, transforms inputs into outputs. Now, what we've done is, and there's, a, there's an interaction, however, with, an o with environment and a feedback uh, capability. So the purple. Uh, is the feedback uh, into the into the system engaging with and interacting with an environment and rather however rather than talk about inputs and outputs we've just tried to change them into terms that meant more in our own language so re resources we I think is easier for us to understand what we're talking about in the development context and we have rather than outputs and outcomes those are really sort of the results that we that we care about Another aspect of this has to do with rules. And rules, I think, we feel are really very important. Rules, in this sense, are important for essentially how our resources translated into and affect uh, what goes on in this transformation process and in the transformation into, res into results. And then we have a set of, of, of actors who are assuming various kinds of roles. And again, uh, although there could be a lot more, I've got three colors up here to represent three different kinds of roles that may be played in a, in a system. And lastly, we have the relationships that exist between them. And again, uh, there are three different kinds of relationships identified here, but by all means, it could be all sorts of different kinds of relationships that, that matter. So what we're talking about then is essentially uh, a transformation process that involves uh, roles and relationships, um, engagements of various kinds of actors. Uh, we have rules that are important for determining how resources are deployed, how roles are defined, how relationships, uh, can, what's allowable and not allowable in terms of relationships, and ultimately influencing uh, results. So that's basically a little bit about what the five R's are. Um, if you know, I, it, if you have reactions to whether or not you think this is useful, that would also be, also be helpful. The last thing that we have said, though, is that one of the important moves that we need to make, and this relates to the fourth point here, has to do with how we understand results. We have tended in our agency to focus results on both ones that are relatively short term and that are quantified. 
And one of the, th they're basically the outputs of a process. And one of the things that we've said is really important to do is that we really need to expand our definition of what a result is. That we need to be interested in the, in the system itself that produces those results and develop ways to measure whether or not the system itself is getting stronger, more resilient, more durable or not. So it, it's, it is a shift in the way in which we, it, it's not that we want to move away from our, our, our uh, focus on what are we accomplishing in terms of outputs and, and outcomes. But, all, but rather that we need to expand what we include as a result. So another, another aspect that goes back to the paper itself talks about the, pro the process of, of, of projects and project design. Um, already, I think we, we're, we're sort of pushing beyond where the paper is on the basis of some of the comments to suggest that it really isn't about design as a, as a discrete activity, but rather design as a process. And that, in, that begins even before you put pen to paper in terms of how do you begin to engage with that system, understand what its boundaries are, understand what the perceptions are of various actors within it, uh, what their desires are, and then tries to encapsulate that in a design and then c extends on beyond that in terms of an ongoing engagement with the system through monitoring to maintain whether or not the various change, the various uh, engagement, the various interventions are actually having the desired effects. And so there really needs to be this sort of ongoing and fairly continuous engagement with the system. Incidentally, as I mentioned, the paper has a series of principles, 10 of them. Uh, the first four of them really relate very much to the, to the uh, understanding of the system, the second six uh, to the principles uh, the second six principles to this design process. The third part of it, and this may seem a little bit sort of out of, out of kilter uh, with this, but is this question around risk. And part of the reason that this is really important has been because um, by virtue of our new, renewed interest in providing funding directly to local, uh, local actors, uh, it has sort of raised up this question about the reliability of their financial systems and so forth. But so, and, and increased attention to, to financial or fiduciary risks. But as we have been doing that, we, be, we, we sort of said, well, you know, really, there are lots of other kinds of risks we need to be paying attention to. And if we're going to pay uh, additional attention to fiduciary risks, let's talk about these other kinds and let's do it in a comprehensive manner so that we're not only concerned about fiduciary risks, but we also understand as we think about engagements, what is that likely to do about, say, programmatic risk, which is the risk that the intervention is actually not going to accomplish what it is we expect it to do. Um, so we need, so what we're arguing for is sort of essentially two things. We need to sort of take our various efforts at assessing different kinds of risks and bring them together in a kind of a comprehensive single examination. And the second thing that we're doing is that we need to have a bit more of a balanced uh, discussion about what is it, you know, balancing risk and reward. So in other words, in the private sector, it's not about minimizing all risks. It's sort of saying we're willing to assume some level of risk because we anticipated a substantially improved reward. Um, we're not talking about turning USAID into venture capitalists, but what we are talking about is sort of having a better understanding of what do we expect to be able to accomplish. And obviously, the sustainability of these results is a really important thing to be shooting for because uh, uh, you know, that's the way in which uh, we actually get the most uh, sort of greatest effect over the longest period of time. And the last one, which I've already basically alluded to, is this question about monitoring and evaluating for sustainability. So part of it is this issue that I raised before about expanding our definition of results and then developing indicators. Um, and those can be both quantitative or qualitative about how do we understand the system and its health. You know, how do, we, how do we measure whether, in fact, we are collectively making progress in terms of improving the functioning of a system and the nature of those roles and relationships? Um, and I think that that's an important shift. We have been focusing, you know, we've done a lot of emphasis on sort of assessing individual capacity development. We've talked more about organizational capacity, but what we're really talking about here is system capacity. And then the last part, last 
piece of it is how do we, you know, it's really sort of measuring whether we really are sustaining these results. And maybe you have got other ways of doing it, but the one we came up with was moving more in the direction of ex post evaluations. So that basically means uh, going back to a project uh, three to five years after its conclusion and seeing what happened. Seeing whether, in fact, the results that we, you know, that we were expecting have persisted over time. But I think one of the other things we also expect is that sometimes the greatest effects were not necessarily the planned ones. And so there may be other kinds of results that may be important to capture about it. So to understand that process, but also we hope that if we, the part of the other part of it is sort of the proof of the pudding, that if we are able to engage more and more in these, in these systems over time, we would expect that our, process, our, uh, our performance in terms of sustainability would improve over time. Now, unfortunately, it's going to take us quite a while before we start seeing the results of that process. But even now, I think we're, we've made a commitment in calendar 14 to start the first round of these ex post evaluations. And so we will be uh, at least establishing a bit of a baseline um, as we move forward. So I'm almost done. Um, so essentially, what I've tried to lay out is both what's in the paper, sort of the foundation that we're working for, some of my own orientations. And I just, before we open it up and sort of say, how do we make the most of this, I, I wanted to sort of pick up on a point that Gene made at the end, which is that as we do this, we, uh, we have to be a little bit aware of the challenges that we're facing with our, our own agency and with those that we work with on this topic. I mean, I think that one of the things I certainly, under, I certainly agree with about um, with the uh, gene on is the fact that our agency has a relatively low tolerance for abstraction and is very much practi practically oriented. So the question then is how do we move in this direction? Now the way in which this usually manifests itself is somebody comes up with an interesting idea and they say, where's the template? Well, the fact of the matter is, is that moving in the direction of templates, it seems to me, is antithetical to what it is that we're talking about. So the question is, how do we make this practical, but encourage the kind of thoughtfulness and reflection and engagement that essentially is necessary for, for doing this? Um, the second part of it is, is that we have a relatively limited number of sort of uh, committed you know, people who are already sort of um, committed to sort of pushing the systems agenda. Uh, we have a listserv within the agency. Uh, you know, we've got 10,000 people around the world. The listserv has got 60 names on it. So it's not, it's a start, but uh, it's not a huge uh, number to begin with. Um, another issue is, is that clearly, you know, we're talking about a change management strategy. It's, I, I don't think anybody would, would disagree that this is going to take some time. But unfortunately, the nature of the cycles, both uh, within the within the bureaucracy that we have, you know, changing from administration to administration, uh, changing from priority to priority as time goes on, uh, means that sometimes our time horizons are pretty short. So how do we try to sustain something like this uh, over time? Another, you know, another uh, issue that we face right now at the moment uh, mentioned USAID Forward. Uh, with USAID Forward has come a raft of new policies and procedures that are being all pushed out to the field. And the reaction that we have gotten um, in stereo from the field is enough is enough. We're, you know, we're having a heart, you know, we're exhausted with all of these changes. We're trying to do the best we can to make, uh, to, to, to carry forward on the ones that have come out already. Uh, piling more on at this point just makes it more and more complicated and we really, you know, what's our attention span to these new things. Not to mention questions about limited training resources and, and then finally question around incentives. You know, how do we, um, as we mentioned, we, 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 we operate in an environment that privileges results in the short term that are, tend to be quantitative. How do we uh, if that's the focus uh, uh, all along the line, how do we begin to shift that to allow uh, a focus more on results that are probably not going to be visible for, for quite some time and may not necessarily be captured in quantitative methods? So at this point, I'd just like to, to, to end, 
in my part of it and then open it up. But again, what I'm really looking for, um, by all means, any questions are fair game, but what I'm really most looking for is any thoughts you may have about how we can make the most of this opportunity. Uh, and uh, because I really do think that this is the, I mean, not only is this, I think, the first time that USAID has gone on record in terms of making sort of this firm a statement about sustainability, but it making this clear connection between systems and and sustainability. And I think that um, this really is a great, great opportunity, and I want to make the most of it. I mean, I think that that certainly is uh, can be this question about accountability and, and compliance can certainly be added to the to the list of challenges. I mean, we 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 operate as a U.S. government agency within a, a legal framework, um, and that's determined um, in, in large measure by um, legislation. So obviously, what we you know what we're what we're trying to do is to, is to essentially uh, identify uh, what we can do given the given the legal requirements that we have at the moment. Um, at the same time, I think that we we um, we do feel that by putting putting out a, a clear statement on what our objectives are and how we are going to achieve them, that we hope that uh, one result of this is to sort of ex explain to perhaps skeptics. Uh, perhaps on the hill or, or elsewhere, that uh, providing, uh, you know, that, that this kind of an approach makes sense, uh, that sustainability is a valued objective of the agency, and that indeed um, uh, providing funding directly uh, to organizations is an important part of it, uh, that it's all sort of part of a well thought out strategy. So that's, and, and as part of this consultation process, we are talking to a, you know, broad cross section of, of of of, uh, of, org of individuals and organizations, both uh, our you know our, our our partners in implementation, uh, but also others who uh, shape uh, the sort of uh, policy community around this topic. So on the hill and think tanks and so forth. So that's the strategy. Yes. Hi. Mike Lennon. Um, several, I guess, GWs, an organization, I'd say. Um, first, go, uh, you know, go Chip. Uh, well, it's more than me. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, and, and the community of like-minded. Um, and um, <clears throat> a question that I, I heard you say, which um, is like, where to begin and how to extend might be um, USAID as a learning system and the degree to which people can um, learn across the USAID world um, and the partners in the ecosystem of USAID can become more effective at learning because, it, you know, not just aid, but most development projects, um, the failure rates are 50 percent or higher and um, there's not honest exchange of why that is and how it is. And so if we, we can transform people's experience of what it means to relate to things that didn't go as expected, and how do non-results produce insight into future results? Um, we can help uh, folks get something that currently they're not getting, and um, and you know once people have the experience, uh, you don't have to. It, they naturally start acting in the way rather than um, needing more preaching and policy. Great, thanks. That's a great suggestion. Can we take one more? 
we take another question from the webinar? Okay. Um, this is a question from Jody Unayek. Um, she is a senior technical advisor from USAID IDEA um, GP. And her question is, how would you connect these notions of systemic thinking to cross-cutting approaches and the issues related to how USAID is organized, both regionally and sectorally, to get work done? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I mean, I, I, I think you put your your finger on a, on a on a big challenge, and I think it's it's not only uh, a challenge for for this effort, but uh, as you implied, uh, for any cross-cutting um, effort, because uh, you know, for some for some activities there are natural organizational homes within USAID, and for others there there are. Uh, Actually, uh, you know, these things do cross cut, and there are people working on it from a variety of different perspectives. I mean, I, to me, I think that that at least one of the objectives that we were trying to do with the paper was to provide a bit of more sort of space for for anybody who was sort of working on these on these uh, systems type concepts in their own particular areas uh, to feel as if they had more sort of overarching support. But also, I think to create the opportunities for more cross-fertilization. Um, and I think the point that, the earlier point that was made about, you know, how do we learn from each other? Um, and so, you know, I, you know, I think that, that on the one hand, I think that one of the, perhaps one of the strengths is the fact that we have examples and applications and so forth in quite diverse uh, technical uh, areas and in different parts of the world. Um, but at the same time, and that perhaps provides opportunities for learning. But uh, I think that one of the, you know, the challenges that keeps coming back and has been a subject of conversation even within those 60 people on the listserv is, you know, how, you know, do we need sort of an organization of home? How do we keep essentially a community of practice alive uh, that is able to not only just sort of inform, but actually begins to have some influence on, on the actions that we take? And as I said, we don't have a magic answer for that. Just, you have to click it once. It's supposed okay. to go, it seems to be going off. So. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> um, so I have a, it's kind of a question and a comment. I think mm -hmm. sort of one thing that would really help you talked about incentives and how to sort of improve uptake on this. And I think sort of really articulating what the benefits of it are and that sustainability is a word that is so used in this space and that everybody promises that everything will give you sustainability all the time. And so if you, <laughs> a little cynical, but you know, sort of how do you articulate what the benefits of this are beyond sustainability and particularly for a very practically minded group of people, sort of what that means about how it makes their jobs and their design easier or better as opposed to this is one more thing that has come on top of every other policy reform. Can I press you though on that? Is there any, I mean, do you have any, I mean, I, I agree with you, but the question is, um, you know, how, how you know how do we how do we do that? I mean, part of the, I mean, it isn't it. it I mean, there is a, there is going to be. I mean, to me, the way I would say it is is that making this investment and trying to move in this direction to think more systemically may be may take more may take some effort on the front end. So that is it's not costless, but on the other hand, the benefits will be greater. So we need to figure out a way to sort of demonstrate that, but it's a little hard to do that if they haven't been willing to take that first step themselves. So I, the question is, is that you know, uh, I mean, we, as you rightly pointed out, we have hung an awful lot of this on the sustainability uh, lens. But if there are other ways that we can talk about these benefits and make them, you know, clear and practical, uh, maybe there are examples that we can point to. We'd love to, love to know what those are. Because I think your strategy is absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, I'd say one thing is if you've got sort of 60 people in a community of practice. Yeah. 
Um, so if you've got sort of 60 people who are in a community of practice who are interested and excited about this, you know, they can talk about what they've been doing sort of in a broader group or if there are ways to kind of showcase those examples um, or reach out to peer organizations that are trying to do this. I think also some of it is framing in how this helps you avoid pitfalls. So one thing that system thinking is great for is that it helps you not run into a problem two years down the line because you didn't think about it because you weren't thinking about the system, you were thinking about something much smaller. Um, so I think there are lots of benefits that you could articulate that are a little shorter term and sort of easier for people to get their heads around. Jane Downing from USAID. I just wanted to comment on that. Is it, it, I wonder whether um, some of these benefits would be more more quickly realized if if we move from the general systems thinking en general to the actual programmatic areas in which we work. So Eric is working in health systems and he has been working in health systems for some time and been thinking about it and has some really interesting thinking. We've been working in market systems. Our practitioners feel we've been doing this for some years. We clearly have a lot more to learn. But, but whether, and, and, and when, it, when you get down to the, the, the technical areas, be it health or education or market systems, then systems become a, a tool, a way of thinking that, that helps us uh, address <laughs> certain problems, you know, rather than, so anyway, I, I just wonder whether that would help things catch on more if, yeah, if we move to more specific. Uh, that's a good, uh, uh, that I think is a, is a very good, uh, is a very good thought. Um, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, there are clearly areas, as, as you mentioned, uh, where this kind of thinking has uh, really made, you know, important inroads in, uh, in the way in which uh, people come to the problem. So that may very well make some sense. I think one of the other things that we've, we've also considered is the possibility of uh, perhaps identifying a limited number of missions that may, you know, where there is already perhaps a predisposition uh, to sort of embrace some of this and sort of work more directly with a limited set of, of missions to, to both uh, support what they're trying to do as well as sort of learn some of their practical problems in terms of moving this, moving this forward. So um, the point's well, point's well taken, small bites at the apple. I have another question um, from one of our webinar participants. Um, this is from Lauren Kasky at DAI. Um, and the first is a comment. Um, she says that understanding the local system is key. Um, and if she understands correctly, this involves examining resources, roles, relationships, results, etc. And her question is, how do we ensure how do we ensure during this mapping exercise that the voices of the most marginalized are heard? Um, well, that's a very good point, and um, I, I mean, I think that a there's actually some language in the paper itself that says that's part of what we what we mean. I mean, what we're and I think that certainly one of the thing, and, and but I think it probably deserves uh, to be to be reemphasized. I think that one of the things, as I said, that I've I've really sort of come to really more deeply appreciate about what Bob Williams was talking about when is this issue around perspectives and how it really is, since we are operating this and system is essentially a mental construct, different people are going to have different visions about what the, what the system is. And it's really, I think, one of the values of this is to sort of really do to understand that the way we may think about healthcare delivery or we may think about agriculture, you know, maize production may not necessarily be the way that, uh, that even the people who are engaged in those activities think about it. And that it's really very important for us to get a, a better sense of, of perspective, uh, of it, the range of perspectives. And I think that clearly understanding um, and being committed to sort of looking beyond usual suspects and the power brokers in a society and sort of looking at those who, who are uh, more marginalized is an important part of it. That said, you know, I mean, again, we, we have uh, within USA, both now and in the past, uh, you know, an avalanche of different assessment tools, and 
And I think that one of the challenges that we face is coming up with if you, some sort of a sweet spot, a sort of good enough assessment. You know, what's good enough in terms of being able to understand the you know, the, to understand what's go the system dynamic, the dynamics that are going on within a system, and so on, without sort of expecting that we're going to require a two-year an deep anthropological study, um, because uh, you know that that. Uh, that has been a road we've gone down in the past. And so I think that, you know, it's really more a question of, of coming up with, you know, practical, thoughtful ways of doing it, but at the same time trying not to overburden with too much uh, expectations. Hello. So my name is Jacob Gray. I'm with ACDI VOCA. And, uh, I found the, the comment that the, the man from GW was talking about and, then, and very interesting and also linking to the program risks component, which, are, you know, in some ways, in a lot of the worlds that we work in as implementers, the program risk is not achieving the, the results and the targets that you have anticipated from day one in a proposal down to day five or down to year five. Um, and we spend a lot of time slogging through sometimes some very static approaches because the program risk of not achieving those is poor reputation, loss of funding, et cetera, et cetera. What I find in a systemic approach really interesting and important is that a system is dynamic. And to think that if we are having a systemic effect over five years, we should actually see some changes in which maybe our approaches that we started with do no longer fit with the systemic change that we're, we're working on. And so the question of a non-result <laughs> being a non-result, actually with the right questions and the right research, a non-result can actually be a very profound result in a systemic um, approach or in a systemic program. So some way to work through USAID in their programming and in the incentives to how to do good programming that rewards this sort of, a sort of continual R&D process and the adaptation and you know, still being held accountable surely to our targets and our results, but also being able to redefine those as we move along in our programming is really important. No, I, I think you're absolutely, I mean, I think you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, we, we do talk about, there's one of our principles about flexibility um, and finding ways to, to, to be able to make those adjustments. Um, I think that it's also clear that, you know, we learn as we as we as we in, as we engage collectively, and this, the system sort of you know makes adjustments. And, I, and so, trying to create uh, the space for that kind of thing is really, I think, central. Um, but it again goes back to and, and and this has been a I'm sure has been a topic that has been sort of fairly recurrent in this kind of seminar and so forth. Is you know, but at the same time. You know, trying to to accommodate that within the existing um, uh, procedures and so forth is a is a challenge. Now, I think we are trying to work on increasing the flexibility, but uh, I think we got a ways to go. Wonderful. So, um, going back to the webinar audience, um, it's a very active chat. Um, we've gotten a lot of questions and comments from everyone online. Um, I'm going to state a comment first from Mary McBay, um, and then a follow-up question from Elizabeth Dunn. Um, so, Mary stated that we have learned in value chain development that engagement on all fronts, from businesses in the market system to policymakers and funders, is that we have to have a strong, short, medium, and long-term results. Without strong, short-term, obvious results, the approach won't work on the ground or with supporters. So showing that a systems approach brings stronger, short-term results is key, and it usually does. And Elizabeth um, followed on to that with a question and asked, um, she said, something that might be helpful for implementers would be early indicators of systemic change. Um, and how do we monitor so that we know when this early change is emerging? Um, those both sound like, sound like, sound like great ideas. Um, I don't know if either of them have some examples where they've actually uh, done something like, uh, like that. Um, that would be helpful to know. whether. Uh, I mean, I think that's that's exactly the kind of direction that we need to go. You know, how do we 
how do we see signs uh, th that uh, the system is changing and, and, and try to capture that fairly fairly quickly. Um, not only, it seems to me, for the sort of re reporting requirements, but also, I think, to um, uh, feed back into the process about, you know, are, the, are we really on the right path? Do we need to make adjustments and, and so on? Um, I mean, and I think that thinking about short, medium, and long-term results obviously is a thought is a sensible way to go. But you know, I think the, you know, I, if there are examples where uh, that has actually been six, you know, sort of uh, attempted in practice, and 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 there are some, you know, there's a story to be told about that. That I would, in particular, be interested in in knowing how that how that was done. I think the uh, Women Empowerment Index is a seems like an excellent start to uh, sy systematic thinking about uh, women in uh, developing country, particularly in agriculture. Um, do you think that could be a great start to a more s um, bringing that into every program? Um, I'm, you know, I mean, I think what I, the way I would sort of approach this is, and it goes back to one of the questions or comments that was made earlier about making sure that you are engaging with marginalized populations. And so it seems to me that that certainly uh, in some cases uh, women have been sort of identified, you know, have been uh, a marginalized uh, and sort of neglected group as a whole. So part of what I, you know, I think is really is important is as we sort of try to understand the system um, and the various different perspectives that we understand the perspectives also from a gender point of view. Now, I mean, I'm, whether the index itself is, is, a, is an appropriate one, I don't have the detail to, to be able to answer that. Let's take another question from the room. A lot of the comments, beginning with the introduction, seem to focus on how do we get systems thinking framework to adapt itself to the way aid business operates. And I think the work of William Easterly, Chris Coyne, Ben Ramalingan pretty much have brought out, brought out the evidence that the aid business has become far too uh, internal in its thinking it's far less uh, effective uh, in the context, the larger context within which it operates. So I'd like to turn the, the question on its head is how aid business can, or how systems thinking framework can help aid business to recognize that it's no longer doing the, the creating the results that it thinks it's creating. Is creating results that that match its internal incentives, but don't match the needs of the larger environment within which it's working. <laughs> well, I, 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 um, since I'm I'm essentially up here uh, uh, in talking about this paper, representing the agency, um, I. You know, I, I'm really, I mean, I have my own personal views on the matter, but I'm, I, I think that what I would only say is that, um, you know, I think that there is a, there's a lot to be, to be said, I think, particularly from Ben's new book uh, about the, you know, the mismatch between the tools that development agencies have at their disposal and the way they go about uh, deploying them and the nature of the development problem. But I think that, you know, again, the, we are a creature of both executive branch and legislative branch uh, approaches here. And uh, despite our own, you know, our own, where our own predilections are, um, we, we operate within a framework. And so I think those are really important, you know, those, you know, those crit critiques are important ones. And I would just say I think there are others to whom they should be addressed. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Um, so we'll take um, another couple of questions from the webinar. Um, Chip, a couple of people have had questions. You mentioned a listserv earlier. Um, and some of our online participants were wondering how they might join the listserv. OK. Well, that listserv that I was referring to is only internal to USAID. So if the people who are asking are internal, then, then um, they can send me an email and we'll get them on it. I think that, but the larger point, I think, is, and, and again, I don't, um, it, it may, we, we have platforms for broader exchange with the external um, community, uh, most particularly Learning Lab, which is a platform we, we, we've created within the last year or so to f sponsor these kinds of, uh, and of course, uh, this microlinks as well. So, um, you know, I mean, I think that clearly this, you know, one of the things I'm already taking away is sort of thinking about how can we continue to support and engage in this broader learning you know, sort of peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, a process uh, and use it to our advantage. And um, so I think that thinking about how to uh, make sure that we, you know, continue to have this kind of conversation after this session ends and so forth is going to be important. So uh, if it's internal, we'll get you, you know, we can get you signed up right away. If it's external, we'll, you know, we'll put some more effort into thinking about how we can uh, and what the appropriate vehicle is for sort of continuing this kind of conversation. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, one more question um, that I wanted to get in there. This is from Scott Yetter um, over at Global Communities in Washington, D.C. Um, and he asked, where does political will and authority fit into systems thinking? And how will USAID play a more progressive role, or how might USAID play a more progressive role in supporting implementing partners working in context where the local systems are not inclusive, but good development requires more inclusive systems. Um, and just to follow on, will this type of thinking propel, perhaps propel USA to make a stronger stand for good development? OK. Um, there's a lot in that question. Um, so let me, let, me, let me take a couple of, of, of uh, let me, let me sort of point out a couple of things. I mean, one of them is that I think that the cons sort of the implicit concerns that were, that were in the question. So in other words, local systems are, I mean, we've been talking about USAID existing within a, you know, foreign policy system here in the United States. I mean, we, the, these systems exist within rule structures uh, that distributed power and authority within the within countries. Sometimes, though, you know, we've identified that there's an incompatibility with the objectives that we're trying to achieve and the structure, the rule structures that exist. And so clearly, by putting rules front and center in what we're talking about in these five R's is sort of saying we need to be atten we need to be more attentive to the way in which these rules operate. And I think implicit in that, and I mean we have uh, some track record in this area that uh, th there are ways that we can use our programming resources, including conditionality, uh, as ways to address those binding uh, uh, rule-based constraints. Um, oftentimes, there are reformers within the societies to, that we can partner with to, to achieve those particular ends. So I think one point is, is about the, the emphasis that we've placed on rules. The second thing I would say is, is that we've made a very big emphasis in there, and there's a really nice example in the paper about accountability. And I think that one of the, I mean, on one hand, we say it is one of the principles is, is that we need to be, you know, because of this sort of systems construct, we need to understand that there are systems operating in all environments. So some of those systems may be quite deplorable in terms of what the, what the results are and so forth. And the question is always then, do you, you know, what's the best way to do it? Do you go around it? Do you engage with it? How do you engage with it and so forth? I mean, that's a problem that we as implementers working in diffi sometimes difficult situations deal with all the time. The issue that we're saying here, though, is again, is to sort of reemphasize a point that came out of a recent USAID strategy on democracy rights, human rights and governance which is to emphasize the opportunities for accountability outside of sort of the, the formalized political processes. And so one of the things that we, we push on this is the fact that there may very well be opportunities to work on those accountability relationships even in otherwise difficult situations. Uh, how can you begin to start you know, ensuring that parents have some degree of accountability over the education that their children are receiving from schools? How do you ensure that the users of health clinics have 
uh, an ability to have some degree of, of accountability on the health care that's being delivered to them. Um, and there are, you know, a variety of ways uh, of doing it. And not only does that, it's, you know, as the, uh, as the example shows, is that makes sense from a, an idea of sort of empowering in, in, uh, local people, but it actually ultimately improves the results as well. Um, the last thing I would say about it, and one of the reasons we made such a pitch on this accountability, is that we, we, I think we've come to the conclusion that it is those accountability aspects of systems that give it its, its, that, that give it its uh, adaptability. And that adaptability is really critical because that's, as I've mentioned before, because ultimately that's what gives it its sustainability. I mean, we're not trying to create once, you know, rigid uh, systems that here that don't have the ability to, to adapt. We, we need to create those adaptive uh, capabilities because environments change. Uh, and the systems need to be able to adapt. So I think we've got several ways that we sort of have identified this question about, uh, you know, sort of understanding sort of the power dynamics that exist what we may be able to do about it, and the importance of accountability. And we'll take one last question from the room. And if we didn't get to your question, please go on the Microlinks event page and under comments, post your question there, and I'll work with Chip to get your question answered. Hi, my name, my name is Glenn Burnett. I'm with uh, Practical Action. One of my colleagues uh, at Practical Action has been working with the SEAT Network to develop uh, a systemic approach to m and and I think some of the things that you're talking about right now um, really, uh, really kind of get into almost a chicken or the egg uh, situation where you want to be able to show that systemic work um, has impact, but a lot of the impacts that you actually get with a systemic approach is actually going to be focused more on um, indirect impacts that come from uh, from some of the uh, uh, some of the other parts of the system that you're working in. Um, and I guess the question that I was going to have for you is recognizing that sometimes the M&E systems that are used to pull out um, results that come from these kinds of approaches uh, are in fact more direct uh, in, in structure. How do, you, how, do you, how do you get those examples that you're looking for that maybe are not going to automatically be apparent within the current M&E structure that we use? Um. Well, I mean, I think actually, I mean, of the f sort of of the four topics that we sort of identified as sort of areas that we're we're, we're actually slightly farther ahead on the M and E one than on some of the others. Uh, there has been an interest, particularly within um, the uh, the lead office on monitoring and evaluation within USA Learning Evaluation Research, to already um, begin to sort of at, uh, sort of say what kinds, looking more broadly and saying what kinds of uh, monitoring and evaluation techniques are out there to sort of understand how to get at these sort of deeper questions. And uh, we have a, already, you know, uh, uh, a note that's, we're, that we're making available throughout the agency that's sort of talking about them and testing out some of these, these, these ideas. I mean, I, I, this question about, you know, how do, we, how do we monitor in these difficult, I mean, there has been a challenge for several years um, as we've been engaging in uh, high conflict areas and so forth where we've needed a lot of adaptability and so on to try to figure out how to measure the, per the effects that we're having um, in those. And so there has been this crying need and it predated our work on the systems, although there's obviously some advantages. So, I mean, just as you know, one example is essentially it is qualitative. But I mean, this is why I emphasize this point about ongoing engagement with actors in the system is like bringing them together and just asking them how is things are things working, you know what needs to be changed? Are the assumptions that we made together when we started this thing really still applicable or not? And then are do we have the ability to make adjustments? Um, I mean, I've personally been involved in a in a in a, in a project that sort of worked that way, and I just you know I didn't realize how unusual it was at the time, but it just worked extraordinarily well. And to me, one of the other big important parts of it was is that, you know, we, you start talking to different parts of the, of the, of a system and they don't necessarily understand or know all the other actors that are there. And by bringing them all together and beginning to create the sense that this was, this happened to be in a input marketing system that, you know, imp, you know, the importers, the bankers, the the distributors, the end users, and so forth, were all part of a system that they, you know, that they began to realize. Yes, we were competitors in some respects, 
but we all have a shared interest in seeing the system survive and to, and to thrive. And uh, so what do we need to do to make this, you know, make these kinds of improvements? So at least that's one technique, but it's not by only means the only one. Please join me in um, thanking Chip Walker. <laughs> and thank you all for your comments and questions. Um, we are taking a break in December for the holidays, but we will resume in January. So please stay tuned for more MPEP seminars. Thank you.